Okay, now that we've talked a little bit about fossils and what they are and uh, what kinds of fossils there are, let's get into some fun activities. Uh, make sure everybody has their worksheet in front of you because we're going to be going through this and talking about things and, and uh, answering some questions and then looking at some examples together as a group uh, of different kinds of fossils and fossil processes. Okay, so make sure you have this worksheet. Um, the first thing I want to do is to ask you a question. So why is it hard, or why do you think it would be hard, to preserve soft, squishy things like worms, jellyfish, and eyeballs? You guys have any idea? Well, it's because those things are soft and easily destroyed by either bacteria or other animals that eat those things. So they either decay or get eaten. What doesn't break down so easily are the hard parts in an animal. Things like bones, teeth, shell, shells, and even fingernails or horns. Even though they're not made of bone, they're still a little harder than soft, squishy parts like eyeballs. So when we're talking about trying to get an animal fossilized, the goal is to try to get it isolated from all the things and forces that are trying to destroy it and preserve it. Well, how do you do that? How do you get a fossil preserved? The key is rapid burial. Getting that dead organism isolated from all the things that want to eat it, decompose it, or destroy it. The vast majority of fossils are buried in environments where rapid burial is possible. So let's talk about that. Where are places on our planet where you can bury things rapidly by natural processes? Think about that. Where are places where you might be able to take lots of mud and sand and dump it somewhere really quickly in order to cover up a dead organism and preserve it as a fossil? Well, one such place might be at a beach or in the ocean or maybe in a delta where lots of rivers are bringing mud and sand continually down into the region so that things can be buried. Other good candidates are lakes and streams, ponds, swamps, and maybe even in some desert situations we have lots of wind-blown sand that can cover a dead organism relatively rapidly. But the key, regardless of whatever the environment is, that we bury this dead animal quickly and stop the decay. Let's review with some questions. Question one. Why is the preservation of soft tissue, meaning soft, squishy things, so rare? Think about it. Question number two. Name two environments in which fossils can be easily buried. Okay, let's look at the answer for number one. Soft tissue preservation is rare because most animals are consumed by other animals. They're not allowed to be preserved. The soft tissue is either eaten or decomposed. And two environments that you can rapidly bury animals in include rivers, lakes, 
or ocean bottoms, beaches, deltas, and sand dunes. Now I'd like to talk about what happens to an animal's remains once it gets buried and enters into the journey we call fossilization. Essentially, there are two outcomes to fossilization. You can either preserve an organism or its parts, essentially unaltered, in the exact same state that they existed in in the living animal or close to it. Or the remains can go through changes, sometimes very profound changes, complete changes in the chemistry of the shells, bones, or teeth, or uh, changes in the chemistry of the tissues from complex molecules like proteins and fats to just basic carbon. These changes can be relatively simple or they can be complex and they can occur relatively rapidly or they can take millions and millions of years. But either way, just think of it as one of two possible outcomes. Either the animal is essentially unchanged until the paleontologist finds it or it's gone through some form of change. We call the original unchanged fossil an unaltered fossil. Now in the case of body fossils, that's an unaltered body fossil. In the case of a changed fossil, it's been altered in some way. Now unaltered doesn't need any more explanation. We essentially have the unchanged part. But when there's alteration, it gets a little complicated. So I'd like to talk about all the various possible alterations that can occur to a dead animal once it's buried and starts its journey towards becoming a fossil. The first and probably most common alteration that occurs is that all of the spaces inside a bone or a tooth or a shell or even inside the soft tissue itself if it's preserved, is filled with minerals. Now, I'm not talking about chemically changing the animal's remains itself, those are staying the same, but the spaces inside of them are being filled with minerals. In other words, they're being saturated or filled with rock-forming chemicals. We call this permineralization. Permineralization meaning through, filled with minerals. So you still have the unaltered shell, bone, or tooth, or even soft part, but all the space inside it now is filled up with rock minerals, making it feel like a rock. Most petrified wood, dinosaur bones, teeth, and vertebrate fossils, things like turtle shells, are actually permineralized. So the original bone from the living animal is still there, but it's been filled up with minerals. We have an example here of a piece of turtle shell. This is the original shell that was in the living turtle. However, it doesn't feel like the original shell that was in the living turtle. It actually feels like a rock. And that's because this shell is filled with rock-forming minerals. Things like silica and calcium carbonate. Another common form of alteration is an actual chemical change to the fossil itself. So if you start out with a seashell whose chemical formula is calcium, carbon, and oxygen, many times those chemicals, those elements, can be dissolved, taken away, 
and replaced with some other mineral. For instance, iron and sulfur. So you start out with calcium and carbon. You dissolve that and you replace it with iron and sulfur, which creates a mineral we call pyrite or fool's gold. So we say the original mineral, calcium and carbon, which formed a mineral calcite, has been dissolved and replaced by iron and sulfur. Replaced. We call that replacement. Easy enough. Another process that can occur in the alteration of a fossil organism is that the soft tissue, all of the complex things that we have in our bodies, like proteins and blood, hemoglobin and uh, enzymes and collagen and all of these things that make up our bodies and our organs can be reduced down to their elemental carbon state. Everything but the carbon in these complex molecules is literally driven away during the heating and the pressure that occurs while rocks are being formed. This results in thin films of carbon left where there used to be an eyeball or some skin or a leaf. We call this process carbonization. We've taken all the other elements and chemicals associated with the animal and gotten rid of them and all that's left is a thin film of carbon that's like a ghost or a photograph if you will of the original animal. Another form of preservation that's very common is molding and casting. And it can be a little difficult to get your mind around this, but really it's just making impressions of the actual remains. So I have here a fossil oyster, and I'm, I'm going to take some clay, which I'm pretending is my rock that it was, it was buried in, and I'm going to push the clay around the outside of the oyster. Okay. Now, I'm going to separate the two. I have my original body fossil, and I have a negative or a mold, kind of a reproduction, if you will, of the body fossil preserved in the rock, or in this case, the clay that surrounded it. This is not the actual body fossil, but it's like a reproduction of it. But it is actually a reproduction of a body part, okay? So it's not a trace fossil, it's a mold. And in this case, it's a mold of which part of the shell? The outside, the outside of the shell. So we call this an external mold. The exterior has been molded. You can also make molds on the insides of shells, okay? So here I have my clay, my same oyster, and instead of molding the outside and making an external mold, I'm going to put the clay on the inside and make a reproduction, not a reproduction, but a an impression of the inside of the oyster or the clam. That's an internal mold, which we geologists like to call steinkerns. It's a German word meaning stone corn or stone kernel. So internal molds, external molds, the original body fossil, okay? Now, one other thing you can do, say I, say I molded the original clamshell. This clamshell 
then later dissolves away, leaving me with just the mold. Okay? Sometime later, I can have other rock minerals come and fill up that mold. Okay? Now, they're making a reproduction of that shell, but it's not the original body fossil, is it? It's not even an alteration of that original body fossil because that original body fossil has been removed. It was dissolved a long time ago. And now we're taking other minerals and making a reproduction, what we call a cast of the original shell. Okay, so a cast is like a copy. It's like a repro of the original body fossil taken from a mold, but it's not the original body fossil. It is still a body fossil, but it's not the original part that was in the animal. Okay, so molds, internal, external, and casts, which can be made from molds, but are not the actual original part. I have a really exciting example of a mold here. This is dinosaur skin. And what happened is sand in a river bar actually covered the carcass of this dead dinosaur and very faithfully, very carefully molded the details of the scales in this animal's skin. Now the actual skin's not there, but I've got a very detailed impression of the skin that's a mold, an external mold. And if I wanted to know what this skin looked like, because this is a negative, then I would take some latex rubber or some other kind of plastic and pour it into this and make a cast to see what the skin actually looked like. So molds are actually an important way of preserving soft tissue information that can later be destroyed. One of the rarest but most exciting forms of fossil preservation is unaltered. And some of the most delicate fossils can be preserved unaltered in amber and tar and pitch and things that can ooze around a beetle or a lizard or a, a bird and preserve them pristinely, unaltered, in all their original glory for millions of years. These substances like tree sap and, and oil completely isolate the original animal from any decomposition. Air can't get in, bacteria can't get in, scavengers won't touch it. And so the most delicate, beautiful little animals can be preserved unaltered for eons inside their little amber tombs. And of course, this was the whole premise behind the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World movies, where because such exquisite little animals like mosquitoes could be preserved for a hundred million years inside of amber. They could extract DNA and rebuild dinosaurs from that information. We call this process of trapping animals in amber or tar or pitch polymerization because the substance that they're being trapped in is a polymer which is a fancy word for just saying it's an organic molecule that repeats itself over and over again. So polymerization, a fancy word meaning trapped in amber, trapped in pitch, trapped in tar or oil. These are among the rarest, but also most informative of fossils that we find.